Hello and welcome everyone to another episode of Scott Schilling Speaks. I'm your host, Scott Schilling. We're going to have some fun here today. We're talking with Carrie Hoffman. Now she's a number one best-selling author. She's going to talk about the power behind the human mind, behind the digital mindset, so many different things. We're going to explore her new book, Bound to Be a Bestseller, because it's part of a best-selling series. So Carrie, thanks for joining us here on Scott Schilling Speaks. Thanks, Scott, for having me. Absolutely. So uh, we're all excited about the Brilliant Breakthroughs Volume 5 launch that's just about to happen and being an author. What, what attracted you to about this project to become part of it? Yeah, I think what attracted me is really a couple of things. One, it's just a, it's a really great um, book series and the contributing authors are, are really awesome. So that that's definitely probably the number one thing that attracted me. And second, um, I just like getting the word out um, to small business owners and really helping them to succeed, which is something that I think is is really important with the number of small businesses that you know don't make it. Yeah, absolutely for sure. It's interesting. Uh, in one of the shows earlier today, we were talking about just the we got a little granular on what small business was. And, uh. <laughs> you know, we, we went past the, uh, the typical small business is the lifeblood of America and most other countries. I mean, we started talking about numbers and the SBA definition was one to 499. And, and it, that shocks me. Uh, it truly shocks me. Uh, but uh We've already addressed that on another show. <laughs> I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to take it there from that side. But, but I've always um, uh, felt that small business was, you know, in that 20 or under range. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's a big difference between a company that's 20 and under and a company that's 500, you know, or a couple hundred to 500. It's tremendously different. Right. So, Yes, there are, there are many great authors, they're great experts in this book and, and in this entire series. So uh, your chapter happens to be the power of the human mind behind the digital mindset. Help us understand what that is. Yeah, so the power of the human mind behind the digital mindset, it's actually the second chapter that I've written in this book series. I wrote a chapter in volume three as well. And, and that book was about digital business and expanded on that digital mindset. So the interesting thing is that I wanted to go deeper than like adopting a digital mindset in order to exceed at the 21st century of business. And to do that meant getting into a topic on mind power. And I think it's an interesting topic because it's been taught for really millennia. And we seem as humans to have to learn it over and over again. Um, but it's also a topic that, you know, people think is a little bit of woo-woo. Um, and I can go into why that is later. Um, but now there's actually a ton of science behind it. And I did a lot of research on the science behind it um, because I wanted to talk about it more. And I was amazed at how much science was behind it. So I, I really wanted to take the leap and talk about the topic and, and um, have it be something in the tool belt of, of small business owners or really anyone um, who's in business. Well, obviously digital is, is playing such a huge role in everything these days. How does it, is it make or break for the small business owner? You know, digital, to me, digital is make or break. And here's why. Um, and and it goes back to kind of my definition of what digital is. We actually exited the industrial age and we entered the next stage. And this started to happen around the year 2000. And the trigger was this exponential growth in modernly architected technology. But the important thing is it completely changed the way that we work. That's what happens when you go from one age to the next. It completely changes the way that you work. So it's a big transformation. And if you're not making that transformation, it's really difficult to grow. So how do you, how do you help people understand the new digital ways? Yeah, well, I like to put it into some context and then I, I like to do a lot of training um, or just helping people understand what it is. 
um, continuous learning happens to be a part of <laughs> um, the new ways of working. Um, but it really entails shifting from a customer focus to something I call extreme customer centricity. And this means that you understand your customer issues at a really deep level. Um, and you're willing to adjust your products, your services, and even your business model to solve those customers' issues. A key component of this is that everybody in your company has a touch point with a customer, which is not that hard for small businesses to do, but that doesn't mean they're necessarily doing it, right? Or doing it well. Right, exactly. And, and again, if it's... Um you know, in this day and age, obviously business will never be done the same way again after this pandemic and what we've been through. Uh, we've, we've opened our eyes to so many uh, other ways of doing things. Um, how do we help people open their eyes to this change? Because it's interesting, while I totally agree with you that we've moved away from the industrial phase, you would think I would have heard of this in the last 21 years, and I really haven't. No, not really. And and for me, um, I would often get into debates with people as to whether their business industry was going digital or whether they needed to, or it, they didn't have to at this time. But one of the things that that pandemic did is it shoved everybody into the next stage. Because one of the ways of working in the next stage is all about talent and about collaboration and about um, being able to reach out, you know, way beyond your geographical area to, you know, get help or get customers or that type of thing. So the pandemic shoved everybody into the next stage because we all had to work remotely, right? Right. In a two week period uh, or less, every single company in the entire world learned to work remotely. And what this told us was technology was more ready than we thought. And people are more ready than we thought to be able to adopt it as long as we don't have these mental model obstacles in the way, right? And so you didn't have a choice on this. And so everybody did it. Mm -hmm. When you have a choice, people tend to debate. Well, it's, it's interesting. We were talking in an earlier show about how phenomenal Zoom as, a, as an example, 10 million users in December of 2019 and 500 million by May of 2020. I mean, the scalability, the ability to rocket and, and lift and redirect efforts now through education. Now, the, you know, can't go to school, but we still have to be in class. How do we do it? We take it and we move this. I think you're, you're right in the, obviously, that when you don't have a choice, it's, it's amazing how quickly you adopt something. Right, exactly. And I love, I love what you just brought up because it touches upon the three categories of different ways of working um, in this next stage that we're in. And the, so of the three, the, the third one is technology. And what you brought up about Zoom is important because Zoom is a modernly architected platform. And because it's a modernly um, architected platform, they were able to scale like with those numbers that you mentioned, an unbelievable ability to scale. You couldn't do that with technology that wasn't modernly architected. The second thing about technology being modernly architected is it's very easy to learn. Like you can learn it just by doing it or you could watch a two minute video and you could understand it. And that's another reason why Zoom was adopted so quickly. But the other two different ways of working are related to talent and to operations. And so from a talent perspective, there isn't a war on talent anymore. There, are, there is an abundance of talent if you're using alternate sources of talent. Um, and those are things like crowdsourcing, freelancing, building partnerships. And then that operations um, way of working, the way that that's changing, one way is easy for small business because you move from working in departmental silos to cross-functional teams. And a small business, especially on that smaller scale that we talked about, they're naturally a cross-functional team, right? Right. Um, but the other thing is that you adapt agile practices and things like that. But even with all those things, all those different ways of working, 
you've got to really start to leverage the power of the human mind in order to even take it to the next level. And, you know, that's where I got into some, some, you know, really deeper topics in the chapter that's coming out uh, in the book releasing next week. Very cool. So what kind of, uh, do you have implementation strategies in there? Do you have, you know, what is the, give us a little peek behind the curtain. Yeah, so you can you can leverage the power of your mind with regular attention and intentional practice. Um, and those those things are really important. So but let's first let's kind of talk about what it is. So everybody knows we have a conscious mind and we have a subconscious mind. What a lot of people don't realize is only 10% of the power of your mind is in your conscious mind. 90% lies in your subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for that is because our subconscious mind is actually connected to the infinite intelligence. And this is where people will look at me and go, well, that's just a bunch of woo, you know, that's, that's not true. Like, how does that work? We actually have access to this um, amazing tool set if we're open to using it. And there's some tools and practices and techniques that you can do in order to I'm kind of quiet that that judging conscious mind that we have and let the subconscious mind play a role. I'm a huge advocate of the subconscious and in the and the difference between the two. And uh, it is fascinating uh, as I've studied it throughout my career to learn numbers like that and learn the the innate ability that we all have. I mean, we, right. all have, we all have intuition. Are we willing to allow it to show up? <laughs> That's the question, right? Right. I'll, and intuition is a good entry point, I think, for people to understand it. Yeah, I, I would get it. I mean, you, the gut feel, right? Mm -hmm. Right. The way you would term it as you, as you open yourself up to this kind of conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Because intuition, everybody accepts intuition. Everybody feels like they have intuition. And, um, and it's a positive, it's a positive reaction to intuition, right? In most cases, people are like, oh, I wish I would have went with my gut or I went with my gut and it was the right thing to do, right? So everyone can relate to experiences that they've had with intuition. And that's why I think it's a good entry point. Yeah, very much so. So how, what other um, tips or techniques or strategies uh, do you tend to help your clients with or those that you've published in the book here that you've put into your, into your chapter? Yeah, so I think the first thing is really understanding it and, and then being open to it, right? Um, that's, always, that's always kind of the first piece of it. Um, the second piece of it is um, doing some practices that are going to help you kind of relax, relax your mind, get rid of the chatter, um, things like that can help you um, in order to connect better to your um, subconscious mind. So things like, you know, intentional breathing or meditation or that type of thing. Um, I think one of my favorite things, though, is to pay attention to what you're thinking about. Because this is how it works. Your, our conscious mind is always thinking, right? And it's, it can be thinking about negative things or it can be thinking about positive things. The subconscious mind doesn't have any filter um, to those things. So, yeah, right? And so you don't want to be feeding your subconscious mind negative things. So the way that I help people apply this to their business is um, a lot of businesses want more customers, right? How you think about wanting more customers will make a huge difference because your subconscious mind is like the subordinate and it'll do whatever the conscious mind tells it to do. So if I keep thinking, I don't have enough customers, oh my God, I don't have enough customers, I need more customers, then our subconscious mind starts working on, I don't have enough customers, okay? Now, what successful people do is they think about what they want to have, right? And they think about it as if it's already happened. So they'll think, a successful person will think, um, you know, I'm going to get more customers. That's, what, that's what's going to happen. And now, now the subconscious mind will go to work on that. Um, it's kind of like, I, I think a good example of this is a lot of people will 
think about something before they go to sleep that they're really desiring in a positive way and or a problem that they want to solve. Like, I, I'm going to solve this problem. I just don't know how yet. And then they wake up in the morning with the answer, right? And this is because our subconscious mind is working 24 hours a day and it's going to work on whatever we're thinking about. So feeding it those positive things is really important. It, yeah, it's, it's interesting because as I was talking to Maggie about all the different shows that we're going to do with all the various authors, um, I said, I, you know, I'm really excited because I know we're going to expose a lot of really cool things. Right. And, but as simple as that statement sounds, it's a positive statement. It, it's a positive expectation on how all these shows would go and, and how great everybody, you know, would share their message and, and all of that. And I think that's, it, it is, it's super important. It's actually one of the reasons I answer the phone the way I answer it, uh, <laughs> do a variety of, of different things. So do you share any tips or techniques that way that would direct people on, on how to stay focused? Because what we focus on, we get. Yeah, what we focus on, we get is absolutely the case. So, so I like to work with people on making sure that they have positive emotions and positive reactions, right? So there's something called the vibrational emotional scale. And the more positive the emotions are, the higher you actually vibrate. And this has been measured. You can measure the frequency of vibration of, of a person. So the, the better the emotions, the more positive they are, the higher you vibrate. And the negative emotions, you vibrate much slower. So one of the things, and, and I ask people, uh, one of the great things to do is do a check on yourself, like actually keep a log of, of your emotions. How are you feeling? Are you feeling negative or are you feeling positive? Because the majority of people actually live on the bottom half of the vibrational emotional scale, which, which is sad. Um, and there's a simple way to get out of negative vibrations, and that's through gratitude. So if we can think about what we're grateful for, you can't be grateful and have negative emotions at the same time. And it's a good way to pop you back up into the positive emotions. Yeah, I, definitely a, a, a great um, tip and technique right there, for sure. The, the, I, I have always loved the thought when people are talking about lack or not being exactly where they want to be is saying, well, are you grateful for what you have now? And it's amazing how many times people say, well, I hadn't really thought about that lately. Right. You know, and well, why should you be delivered more if you're not grateful for what you have? It kind of doesn't make sense, does it? I know it uh, doesn't. It doesn't really go together. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, I love this because I, I, I mean, I'm a, I'm an advocate. I'm a strong believer, you know, that, that, um, again, we can, we can control our own, we can change state. We can control our own destinies. We can do a lot of different things by doing it. We maybe can't control time frames, but we can control the, the other stuff around it. Exactly. Exactly. So what kind of things do people need to know that they don't know right now in the area that you have your expertise? I think one of the things that that people need to know, um, uh, you know, on this same topic that we're on is that there is an alpha state for about 45 minutes before you go to sleep and about 45 minutes after you wake up where your subconscious mind is even more um, apt to receive from the conscious mind. So simple thing of watch what you're doing 45 minutes before you go to sleep, especially don't be watching the negative news stories or things like that, that's a great time to practice your gratitude, even if it's simple things like, you know, being thankful for the food that we have or the air that we breathe. Um, I, so I've done, I guess one thing to know is I've done a, a lot of research on this because I've always been very um, connected to this part of, um, of my life and, and my being, but I wasn't able to 
convince, right? A lot of people of it. So I started doing that research and the science behind it. And so for the skeptics in the world, I have a lot of science to, to uh, point you to <laughs> so you can really start to believe in this because it's very powerful. Dr. Emoto and his studies with water. Would be yes. A, a great one. Fascinating if nobody's seen it, the hidden messages in water uh, by Dr. Emoto. Um, speaking life into water, speaking death in the water, uh, and, and seeing the crystalline difference between the two. Phenomenal. It is phenomenal. I, I love those studies. There's, an, there's another um, thing that you can do. Your, that one's a little difficult to do yourself because you need a high-powered microscope, right? But there's another one you can do where you put two, you get two glass jars and put rice in them. And you put one is love and one is hate. And you actually direct love to one and hate to the other. And the one that you direct hate to molds much more quickly than the one that you direct love to. So that's how you can take his experiments with water and kind of do it yourself with rice. I actually had a, a friend of mine do that. And boy, the, the hate jar was nasty. <laughs> That'll make a believer out of anyone because that's an amazing thing to try. <laughs> well, and it's and it's easily it's actually very easily done, and it and it's a great representation. And what makes Amoto's work so important is our constitution. I mean, we're seventy plus percent water. That's right. So the the there's a direct direct um, equ equation, or or you can equate his work to you and your body based mm -hmm. on that. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting that, that more people, um, that, that's why this work is so valuable. Why well, more people need to know the work quite right. frankly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And if you think about how you feel when someone directs, you know, hate towards you, or if, if you're, if you're not being gentle with yourself, and you're, you know, you're being really hard on yourself. The way you feel inside is because of that constitution of water and the effect that, that those emotions have on vibration. Do you address self-talk either in the book or in your work with clients? Yeah, definitely. I think that the self-talk, it, it's kind of similar to what I was talking about when you're talking about, when you're thinking about what you don't have um, versus what you want. So successful people don't think about what they don't have. They think about what they want. Um, and that's directly correlated to self-talk as well. When you're having self-talk about yourself, you need to make sure that that's positive self-talk, not negative self-talk, because again, the subconscious mind is going to go to work on it. So if, if you tell yourself, you know, I'm not good at riding a bike, whatever it is, then you're not going to be good at it because your subconscious is going to continue to work on making sure you're not good at it. That's how it works. It seems so simple, but it's not. Well, it kind of goes to Henry Ford's statement in 1939. Think you can, think you can't. You're right either way. Yep. <laughs> Very much so. Uh, so again, I, I love the idea that, that you're sharing those practices with people and, and helping them understand the power of what they're saying to themselves so many times you know the oh i'm such a dummy you know it's like mm -hmm. why would you say that to you yeah, don't say that to yourself <laughs> don't say that to yourself <laughs> cancel cancel i'm i'm out of that well the easiest way to get out of that is to turn it around and say the opposite okay that's the easiest way to change that so i'm so dumb Oh, I'm actually quite smart. You just yeah. turn it around into the opposite. No, a great, great way to do. It. That's why <clears throat> parenting, um, you know, working environment, your your boss in their motivational or inspirational style. That's why, um, quite frankly, I don't ever want to be called a motivational speaker. Motivation is outside in. Mm -hmm. It only lasts as long as the motivator is there. Right. I'd rather it be called an inspirational speaker, somebody that inspires something from inside of you to come out to prosper yourself, to move you forward, to do 
things like that. So, man, it's amazing how much, how fast time goes when we do these. <laughs> I think it flew right by. <laughs> do these shows. So how do people, you know, get a hold of the book, get a hold of the book series, contact you, all this important information. How do we make all that happen in your behalf? Yeah. So it's really easy to find me on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm there under Carrie A. Hoffman. Um, that's my kind of LinkedIn and easy to find me there. And if you go there, um, we're doing a whole bunch of posts right now on, on the book and the book series. So lots of links in there for you get to, to get connected to the book. Awesome. And what kind of, just to, to help out one more thing, who's your ideal client? Who's the, who's the perfect business or perfect group of people to work with? Yeah, so I'm glad you asked that question. My, um, my perfect client are business leaders or executives. Um, and because I, I do executive coaching through a focal point business coaching practice. And then I also have a second company with a partner called Get Digital Velocity. And we do digital strategies and roadmaps for companies um, that, that Get Digital Velocity focuses on large enterprises. And what would a large enterprise be? How would you classify that? I mean, um, anything, anything over probably 500 million in annual revenue, we, we go all the way up into the 10 billions of revenue when we work with companies there. That's awesome. Those are, those are good folks to work with. So, <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> how about one more piece of wisdom to leave everybody with? Yeah, I, I would say to really just make sure that you are paying regular attention to your mind and intentional practice to take advantage of it. Sounds like some great advice. Carrie Hoffman, thanks for being here on Scott Schilling Speaks. Thanks, Scott. And want to thank all of you for joining us and make sure you tune in again, same time tomorrow. God bless. <music>